Hello there, lovely people. It's Alex from Nintendo Life here. And, John, why have Metroid games never really sold well? Do you want the definitive answer right now? I want it from you, and then I want the same answer, but differently worded from Xeon. Well, you know what? Mine's gonna be a bit more in-depth than that. I think they can sell well, and they have in the past. So, Xeon, you say things. I'm pretty sure it's because they never released one on the Wii U. Nintendo Land doesn't count, <laughs> but if they would have put one on the Wii U, that could have completely changed the way we look at... I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this, though. <laughs> Yeah, so basically, um, what we're going to be talking about today, if you hadn't already gathered from the title and that very abrupt segue, the Metroid series as a whole has generally sold alright, but it's never been one of Nintendo's big mega hitters. The uh, metric that a lot of people throw around, myself included, is that Animal Crossing New Horizons, that one game, the one game on the Switch, has outsold the entire Metroid series over the course of its life, which is... Frankly, it's absolutely bonkers to, say, uh, to think of it that way, but that's how it be. Yes, first-party Switch software sales are crazy right now. I think New Leaf on 3DS sold, I think it was around 10 million, it's around that mark. But New Horizons has, has tripled that. It's, it's over 30 million right now, I think it's around 35 million. So the Switch is just this, this hotbed for first-party games. So there's no doubt that Metroid's going to do well. But I do think in the past, Metroid hasn't exactly suffered that much. I mean, if you look at the GameCube, for instance, that wasn't one of Nintendo's better performing consoles. In fact, the GameCube hardware is their second worst performing. But on that system, Metro Prime sold around... Uh, let me just get the numbers. The numbers, Mason. So Metro Prime on GameCube sold 2.84 million units, which is more than Animal Crossing, it's more than Mario Party, it's more than Pokemon Coliseum. That's up there with Luigi's Mansion, and it's not too far away from Wind Waker. So I think given the opportunity, Metroid can do really well. And I think you've tapped into the nub of my very argument, because yes, I think Metroid has the potential and has always had the potential, but it's always been released either at inopportune times or kind of in a weird way. I know this sounds strange because they're Nintendo systems, but on the wrong console, like... The Wii had a huge, huge install base, absolutely chuffing enormous. And yet Metroid Prime 3 Corruption only sold how many, John? I have the numbers, I have the numbers. So Prime 3 Corruption, it's not the worst selling Metroid, it's the fifth best selling Metroid. And it sold 1.63 million units, which is a, is a decline from Prime. 1.63 million of anything, except maybe bacteria, is or atoms is a lot. Let's not <laughs> beat around the bush. That's a lot of games sold, but we're comparing this to other Nintendo first parties titles. And the Wii sold how many units, John? According to Nintendo, the Wii sold 101.63 million units. And in comparison, the GameCube sold 21.74. So the Wii is definitely much ahead, but Metroid Prime still sold much better on GameCube. And you know why that is? Why, Alex? It's because, it, well, it's because the Wii's were all owned by people's mums. Does Grandma not want to play Metro Prime 3 Corruption? Um, no. Uh, I oh. did ask, um, but she wanted a cup of tea instead. Oh, maybe Other M then. <laughs> is Other M meant to be some sort of play on Mother? Yeah, yeah it is. That's stupid. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Let's not focus on Other M. Although, how many did that sell, John? Uh, over a million. I don't, there aren't actual stats for other M, but it definitely sold over a million. <laughs> that probably means nobody cares enough to keep track. <laughs> it did sit on the shelf long enough to seem like it didn't sell well. Or copies. I think I picked up my copy new for a fiver. I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of Metroid games do retain their value quite well, but other M just plummeted. But um, not very many Metroid games have sold under a million. And I know a million is held to this standard of being just kind of the gateway to success? Where it's not really. A million is quite a lot of sales. Like games like Xenoblade Chronicles 2 sold around 2 million. Uh, Arms uh, sold on, on the high end of 2 million, towards 3 million. So, like, that, that isn't a bad figure. It's not like Metroid has been suffering poorly over the years. It's just that it's not Mario and it's not Zelda. I don't want to be, like, singling Zeon out, um, uh, but it just so happens, Zeon, that you have not been as fervent a fan of Metroid as I think John or myself. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, you know, downplaying that or saying, how dare you? I just want to know, <laughs> because you are arguably the demographic, but you haven't bought Metroid. Uh, 
I just want to know why that is. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> I've been kind of waiting to bring this topic up because I just wanted to wait for a good moment. And Ooh, this, this, seems, this seems like the best. But so I have bought a lot of Metroid games over the years. I did own Metroid Fusion. I skipped Zero Mission. I bought Other M. I don't remember if it was. I don't think it was at launch, but I bought that. I bought Prime 3 Corruption, granted it was pre-owned. I never had Prime 1 or 2 for some reason. And uh, and I had Super Metroid. I, I don't know how I ever got it over the years, but I, I had I've had all of those different games. And I was trying to think of why, you know, why I fell off of them or why I just never stuck with the series. And I think a big part of it for me is the accessibility. And because in, in a lot of those games, You'll get to a point, you know, you're constantly gaining new power ups and there's secret areas that you need to discover. And it's it's a lot of I feel like the game involves a lot of trial and error. And there are there are points in the game where you, you, you know, like in Super Metroid for me, I, I tried playing that game without a strategy guide. And uh, and I think I, I could have done just fine, but I put about 10 hours into the game and it and it, and then I went to go look up. I looked up a guide to see how far I was and I was about halfway through and people talk all the time about how you can like speed run those games and it's no no problem at all. But for me, I just often would get lost and I think I would get frustrated and I would move on to something else. And you see series like Super Mario for example in or even just Mario Kart some of the newer entries will see accessibility is a huge thing for those games you'll add in there's invincibility modes or in Mario Kart you'll find where uh, you can you can actually uh, there's the steer assist mode so if you have like a, a three or four year old which I'm not trying to to compare myself to uh, a child but you know <laughs> you, if, you've if, already done it Zeon you've already done it <laughs> it's, it's too late, too you late. Can't get back. you're right but you know if you hand a controller to them they can still try to play the game and I feel like Metroid you know I I don't think I don't think we should ever try to do that with Metroid be able to hand I mean maybe yes be able to I would I would love to see a four year old pick up and play a zero mission you know but but I think the thing is, is that Metroid hasn't had a lot of opportunities to innovate in that regard. If So I've been playing Samus Returns recently. I just beat Zero Mission uh, like two weeks ago. And so I'm playing Samus Returns and you find there's there's a ton of different accessibility options. It feels like there's save points scattered all over the place. You have a, a map on the bottom of the screen that you can always look at. You have, I'm, I'm, I don't think this was a thing in previous Metroid games, but correct me if I'm wrong, there's the warp points where you can just hop around to any of the different warp you know nodes on the map or the the teleportation areas and yeah, it's, it's kind of new for 2d metroid yeah, yeah okay cool and and so it just you know that that's a big thing for me is because i would look at you know when i was playing old metroid games i would look at a spot on my map that i hadn't explored or even when i was playing zero mission and i would tell myself i don't want to go i don't want to go run all the way there to find out that there's either a nothing there or b maybe it's just a little uh, missile upgrade and there's there's nothing else and it's on the completely other side of of the planet where now you have these warp areas that you can you can quickly go to and it and sure you're still going to put some effort into trying to get to that point but it doesn't feel like you're spending as much time or wasting the time so long story short for me you know i i didn't stick with the games just because i it, i felt like i would get lost or frustrated very easily and yeah so i, I wonder if that has kind of pushed a lot of other people potentially off of the series not saying I, I i know there's there's merits to to you know that sort of immersiveness that that seclusion that you have when you play the games but uh but yeah i just feel like the franchise hasn't had a lot of opportunities to innovate on that that's interesting yeah i guess it hasn't had that many chances over the years to do anything <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> you, you are right though zeon like, samus returns has quite a lot of accessibility options um like in, for, for instance if you can't find where a metroid is you can just go back to the gate and it will tell you where it is. So like that's optional. You don't have to do that. And it's something that Fusion and Zero Mission both did. Like they both kind of guide you to where you're meant to go. So I guess they're handheld games. You know, you don't want to put your console down and then not know where you're going. But it's nice that they give you the option rather than just pinpointing exactly where you're meant to go. That feels like a good step forward. Um, and I guess in the indie scene as well, we've seen a lot of Metroidvanians over the years uh, during Metroid's lull. Like, the last proper Metroid. If, I, I guess I guess Other Rim was 20, 2011, 2010? But Prime 3 was 2007, and that was like the last proper, you know, open Metroid game. 
Um, in that time, the indie scene has given us so many Metroidvania. We had, like, we had Hollow Knight, we had Cave Story, we had all these games that sort of popped up and um, gave their own spin on the Metroidvania genre. And a lot of them, like Hollow Knight included, are more popular than Metroid has ever been. Like Hollow Knight, yeah. I know it's on multiple <laughs> platforms, I know it's on PS4 and Switch and PC, but it sold more than any Metroid game. And that's not that's not um, a, a, a backhand towards Metroid as a franchise. If anything, that's showing that the interest for this genre has only grown during its absence. I think it's definitely raised the bar though as well, because Hollow Knight is very clever in its structure because one of the things you were saying that, you know, sort of like Fusion and Zero Mission, they tell you where to go. And Hollow Knight does that at first. I mean, sort of. It gives you um, kind of like a bit of a semi-tutorial at first, but then it kind of opens up and you can do the um, the three things. They're, they're called um, they're called Dreamers. The three Dreamers, they're the thing keeping the uh, the egg closed. And you want to open it for mad reasons. Uh, good reasons, actually, but I don't want to get too much into it. But you can do those in any order, and it's not like it says, or it, like, leans you in towards going one way. You kind of naturally go in one direction. A bit like Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild kind of eases you towards Zora's Domain first, but there's nothing stopping you from just ignoring everything that's being told to you and just, you know, going off to Gerudo Desert and just, you know, going and trying to take on Naboru and being completely, completely and utterly unprepared for it. And that is kind of echoed in Hollow Knight as well. And that, I think, is a good balance between the two because Metroid has done something similar. Like Super Metroid arguably has one of the best initial tutorials when it comes to the basic controls and structure because it literally gives you no um like actual worded instruction whatsoever but it teaches you everything it's been analyzed top to bottom by people far more um you know sort of in tune with game design than me but it's really good but that's when it ends and it opens up after only you know sort of 20 minutes tops you know more like 10 minutes i would say and that's where i think we could you know get that balance in there and some accessibility options would also be good. However, I feel we've slightly gone off topic. <laughs> I mean, it's somewhat related, but at the same time, it's not really talking about sales. I, I suppose some people might be put off. Like like Xeon was saying, maybe it's too intimidating for them, and they've tried a prior game, they're like, okay, I'm not gonna buy this. But um, I definitely think the, the genre has pushed ahead, and Samus Returns has a lot of good accessibility options. So I wouldn't fear that Dread is gonna, you know, go back on that. Um, and they even said in the treehouse, like, Adam from Fusion's back, the big, the big monitor thing. And if you want to, he will give you hints, but it sounds like he won't be pointing you where to go. So it, it's a nice balance. Yeah, and, and that's the yeah. one thing that I've really been enjoying a lot is that is that I just have those options to fall back on if I do happen to get lost. Like last night, I I just made it to the the fifth area in Samus Returns, and I found an area where I need to use the... I'm blanking on the term right now, but the jump and it you turn into like a ball of lightning. I should I should just know this. Screw, screw attack. attack. Thank you. Jump. Yeah, the screw attack. <laughs> I, I found I found a wall that I can't get through and I couldn't find any other area to go. And I ran around for probably I probably only spent like ten or fifteen minutes on it. But then I couldn't find you know, I thought I thought I needed the screw attack and I thought I missed something. And I was about to go backtrack through the area four or through other areas, and then I, I ran around and used that ability that allows you to kind of find where there's uh, walls that can be broken and I found a new little area that I was able to get through and now I'm and now I'm officially in area five but without that feature I'm, I might have gotten frustrated and just put the game down and I, I understand that's that's probably a more me problem than the game's fault but but I, th I think that you know just having those options is is going to cause a lot more people that maybe would not have played these games in the past to to try to get into them because you know we see things like when super mario 3d world i think released or 3d land maybe it was where you know if you die in a level too many times you you get the like super tanuki ability and you can basically blitz through a level i think most common players probably aren't going to use that ability or use it very infrequently but that could be a complete game changer for so many players and and i feel like that that could directly affect sales. Maybe maybe not as much for some of us that, that won't take advantage of those, but for me in Metroid, it, it's, it's a game changer for me. Yeah. 
I think the lull is going to do Metroid a lot of good, actually. Because mm. uh, in the mid-2000s, there were a lot of Metroid games. Like we had Metroid Fusion, then Metroid Zero Mission. Um, but also, before that was Prime. Then there's Prime 2, there's Prime Hunters, Prime Pinball, Prime 3, then Other M. There's a lot going on, and I, I love every entry in the Prime series. But I guess, for your casual consumer, maybe there's diminishing returns. Because they're all on you know, fairly similar hardware. Uh, and like from game to game, it is a bit hard to just differentiate the difference if you're looking at a back of a box. Um, and ha having this big gap from Wii to Switch with Prime 4, that's going to be a pretty drastic jump. And also from you know, from the Game Boy Advance to the Switch with, with Dread. I think th this is probably going to give the franchise a lot of energy that maybe it was kind of lacking when it was when it was in its... Uh, I wouldn't say prime, but <laughs> when, when it was in its prime. <laughs> say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious to know, do you, either of you know what the sales were of Samus Returns on 3DS? I'm trying to find it right now. They never revealed them, which is worrying. Mm. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was a bad position, though. I mean, Samus Returns had a lot of fanfare going for it. Like, people were really excited for that game. But it came out months after the Switch when people weren't playing their 3DS. And, you know, it was well-received, uh, and, and speedrunning-wise, it's it's really popular. Like, there's tons of speedruns for Samus Returns. But it's just in that that, that that gap where there's, like, there's WarioWare Gold, there's Samus Returns, that, there's that Dylan game. <laughs> They're all good games, but people just didn't want to play them on 3DS. I think that's really, that's really highlighting one of the biggest problems with the Metroid series sales, is that there's always... There's never been, like, the right time to release a Metroid game, I don't think. There's always been something. There's always been something, you know, sort of, like, Samus Returns came out on the 3DS, a hugely popular system, but it came out after the successor came out. It should have come out a year beforehand, I think. It probably would have done a lot better. Um, I'm a sales expert, as you know. Um, as we mentioned <laughs> earlier, uh, Metroid Prime 3 was released on a system with lo a huge install base, but the install base was so, so not interested in Metroid. Um, you know, sort of naturally there were loads of Wii owners who were, and they bought the game, but they are a very small fraction of the people who were you know, who owned a Wii. And then with things like Metroid Prime, Metroid Prime 2, the GameCube didn't sell well. And it's just, there's always a little caveat with pretty much every single um, Metroid release. I mean, if you go back to like Super Metroid, and uh, even the original Metroid and Metroid 2, you could argue that, oh, there's no excuse then. But I do think that back then, you know, sort of, if you look at the numbers, you have to take into account the fact that gaming was nowhere near as mainstream as it is now. Like, the idea of video games. Video games were still seen as extremely, extremely nerdy. Certainly, I would say, through the 90s. They were starting to ease out. But even so, you know, sort of, it was... Not quite Games Workshop level, but it was definitely seen as kind of like a specific interest. Mm -hmm. It's worth pointing out too, like when, when Metroid debuted, it, it was a pretty huge success. Like Metroid and NES sold, um, I think it's the second best selling game in the series. Yeah. With around 2.7 million units. And that's, that's right behind Punch Out. It's not too far behind games like Excite Bike and Zelda 2 and Dr. Mario. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of games in the Metroid series when you think about it. We're on our fifth of the mainline. There's three mainline primes. There's like three prime spin offs. Uh, it, it adds up to quite a bit, and there have been many opportunities um, over the years. But only a few of them really stand out. And Metroid Prime is the obvious one. I mean, it was the game, it was one of the GameCube's headlining games. We had Mario Sunshine, we had Wind Waker, we had Metroid Prime. Um, and as we are saying earlier, the GameCube as a console, it's not actually that far from the Wii U in terms of sales. But the fact that Metroid Prime was able to sell so well on quite a small install base just shows that the interest can be there if, it, if they are willing to give it that spotlight. And I, I, maybe I'm just being hopeful, but I kind of feel like the with Dread, it's kind of like it's all slotting into place. You know, the Switch is a huge install base and they're interested in more of what we would, I think, as a group consider more traditional video game structure games rather than Just Dance. Um, that's not ragging on Just Dance, but it's definitely targeted towards a different demographic. Um, so I think that Metroid Dread has the best chance that any Metroid game has ever had to sell really well. And mm -hmm. I'll be really honest, I kind of hope that it's going to double the sales of the previous best-selling Metroid game, which has fallen out of my brain. 
at the worst time. So that was Prime. Time. Prime sold uh, 2.82 million units. So are you, you're expecting, well, not expecting, but you hope that Dread sells around over 5 million? I reckon Dread could do 6, maybe 8, maybe more. Um, I think it just has the potential. It's got this, you know, Metroidvanias. As soon as, you know, sort of, there may well be people looking at Metroid Dread for the, you know, seeing it and going, oh, Metroid. Is that because it's a Metroidvania and not realizing that Metroid is where the genre <laughs> comes from? It may well be that there's, you know, that's probably only like, if there's anyone like that, it's only going to be a handful of people. But even so, I think that's entirely possible. You know, it's um phenomenon called the Rice Krispie effect, I think. Uh, <laughs> it's, oh. you ask people what rice, you ask people what Rice Krispies are made of. What, what are they made of, Zeon? Um, sugar? I'm not sure. Are you being serious? Yeah. I mean... They're made of rice! <laughs> oh, really? Rice Krispies! Huh, look at that. I thought it was just straight candy. I, I, can't, tell if, I can't tell if you're pulling my leg. No, no, I'm, I'm being honest. I, I, I wish oh. I wasn't lying, but you, you, you just get full honesty from me. Yep. That, yeah. That's the thing, that it's proper nouns. <laughs> proper nouns. You stop, you stop, you don't dissect them. You know, bran flakes are made of bran. It's all cereal. Everything's oh. cereal. Metroid Dread is cereal. Metroid is made of rice? Um, I want to go back to your sales prediction, Alex. Because you, you predicted that it sells around, I think we started at 5 million, then you went all, all the way up to around 7 million. <laughs> yes. I would say uh, my, my estimate is 6 plus. Uh, I think if you look at like prior games, like Clubhouse Games was something that I think many people underestimated. It sold 3.14 million units, Clubhouse Games. Uh, and then we've got remakes like The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, a remake of a Game Boy game, sold 5.49 million. And I realize Zelda is hot right now, but that is just showing us that these games, which um, I think many would view as probably not on the same pillar as like a brand new like Breath of the Wild or something, but they're still they're still selling crazy well. Um, so th that kind of expectation for sales, I don't think is unfounded. Another point that I wanted to bring up too that is that Nintendo has always sort of I don't want to say they they always have, but they've. It feels like Metroid has, like you guys have sort of said, Metroid has gotten the short end of the stick fairly often. You know, Metroid Prime did super well on GameCube for Nintendo, and lo lots of people loved it. And then they, when they released the DS, they released it with the Metroid Prime Hunters demo. And you know, so a, a lot of people that you know bought the DS for the first time, if they for some reason didn't get a game with it or, or something, you know, they were they were experiencing Metroid and it was one of the, the coolest little tech demos uh, for, for me back in the day. You know, I could run around and fight, you know, I could do like a, the level or I could run around and do some multiplayer and uh, and it was a lot of fun and it, it gave a lot of people a, a good experience for, uh, or it allowed them to at least experience not not a traditional Metroid game, but, but we got to find out kind of what Metroid Prime was about. But then, you know, they go and release Metroid Prime 3 on the Wii without having Metroid 1 or 2 readily available. And I could see that pushing back a lot of the the hardcore uh, maybe maybe not maybe the more casual like action oriented uh, gamers, you know, on on the Wii because a lot of people probably just wanted to play the first and second games and then they released the trilogy later which I, I think was a great move by Nintendo to to package it all in one but I wonder how much that really saved the series at that point especially then when Metroid Other M came out and and it, it had so such poor reception you know it's uh it, it feels like it just it, it can never win <laughs> but now I, I I kind of agree with Alex now and and probably you John as well I feel like the series finally has a moment to shine it's had a nice a nice lull and uh, and now you know now we can see what what the series can do again you touched on something quite interesting Zeon I've thought about this before in the past uh prime 4 which that's in development right now we don't know when it's coming I've always thought, for one, the logo looks weird, the spacing of the logo is weird, but also, <laughs> I don't think it needs to be called for. Uh, I, I think that's intimidating, if anything. But the Prime Trilogy, its story is told. You know, that, that saga is done. Uh, I think they can quite easily call it Metroid Prime subtitle. I think that would help it, rather than make it seem like you're something you have to be, you know, caught up with. Because you don't have to be. Now, that story's done. It's now about, well, from what we know, it's about Psylocke's hunting Samus or something, but yeah, I don't think you need to have that for in the end. Metroid Prime closed captions. There you go, that's the title. Metroid Prime the Hunted instead of instead of Hunters. And people will be like, I need to play Hunters now! <laughs> Metroid Prime Hunters 2 oh, control no. Samus oh, no. <laughs> using a stylus on the Switch oh, screen. I, I low-key love um, Hunters. I think there is so much untapped potential from 
like all the other bounty hunters they introduced there. L like, really. I know Silux, but I found Silux to be one of the lesser of He's the He's one of the hunters. worst designs. I, I tweeted this the other day, and people were angry. There there's Silux fans out there. Have you, see have you seen his design? He's just a big hexagon. He's I a mean, big purple hexagons hexagon. are the best -gons. There are some cool designs in Prime Hunters, and I, I wish they went with someone else. <laughs> Maybe they'll redesign them and make him look a bit cooler. I don't know. I, I, I can't say the Silux is a bad design. It's just I have others that I prefer. Like, I think uh, Candon is the weakest, personally. It's a Cobra Man. Um, but uh, I think Trace, like the, the, the Kraken, the species that he is. Oh, Trace is they've, cool. They're defined as one of the most hated and feared species in the galaxy. They have an empire that spans, you know, solar systems. It's like a rite of passage for a Kraken, like, you know, sort of like a coming of age thing, to conquer a planet. <laughs> Like, that's not a good race. I want to see more of the Kraken. Let's do it. Make, make a Kraken spin-off. Metroid Prime. Um, Kraken. Crikey. There you go. Crikey. Bring it back to sales a moment. Uh, Pikmin 3 Why? Deluxe sold 2.04 million units. That's a lot. That's Pikmin. Pikmin never sells that much. That's the best-selling game in that series. And if Pikmin can do that, then Metroid Dread is at least guaranteed to you know be a success. Uh, it's probably... You know, it's, it's not... It's not um, optimistic to say it's going to be the best-selling game in the series, because it basically is going to be. It's almost guaranteed. So I have a question for you guys. Do you think that the that Nintendo, if they were to release the the past Metroid games, you know, the past four in the, in the series, since Metroid Dread is being considered five, do you think that would help? Or do you think it would hurt the series? Cause, and, and the reason I ask that is because, you know, someone like me might play up to metroid 3 and then i might go uh and then i might not be interested in dread anymore because i i didn't play you know one through one through four i think it would hurt it because at the moment metroid dread i mean we we call it metroid 5 but everyone else is just calling it metroid dread and rightfully so that's the main title of the game it's metroid dread i think they're avoiding calling it metroid 5 dread or whatever because they don't want to alienate people. And I think generally the games have been pretty good at giving you the broad strokes of, you know, the situation. You don't need to know that, you know, Samus grew up on... Did she grow up on SR388 or am I getting really confused? She grew up um, on Zebus with uh, the Chozo. Mm, okay, she grew okay. up on Zebus? With the well, she had her own planet, which was like, um, I think it was called like B BL2 or something like that. Ah, bacon, lettuce, tomato. <laughs> and then Ridley killed everyone, and then she grew up on Zebus. And she left her mark there. I had no idea. I genuinely thought, but SR388 was the home of the Metroids, though, isn't it? Yeah. That's probably where I'm getting confused. Because she's got Metroid DNA, so I thought she came from... No, that's a whole other <laughs> kettle of fish. Her mum and dad were both Metroids. It's a complicated <laughs> story. So what was the question, Zeon? <laughs> uh, so my, my, my question was, do you think that if Nintendo were to release, you know, the, the classic games, all of them on the Switch in like one yeah. big package, you know, not not in sort of like a Metroid Prime trilogy fashion or, you know, maybe release them in, through GBA support on Nintendo Switch Online. Do you think that would hurt the series more than it would help? Because we see a lot of people wanting to go back and play those games, but I'm curious if if they would get their fill from that and then not venture forth into Dread. So historically... This would I I I would like usually I'd say yeah how are you like put put all the Metroid games on Switch but historically this has actually hindered a lot of releases I remember when um, there was a Sly Cooper four that came out on PS3 and before that they had the Sly Cooper HD trilogy and that was a big success but then four didn't sell that great then Crash Bandicoot had the Crash Bandicoot Insane trilogy and that was a huge success Crash Four moderate you know it, it was mid success. So I, I kind of feel like a lot of people, like, they, they jump back into these classic collections and then don't come back for the next one. I think if they released it after Dread, that would do quite well. Yeah. However, I would... Uh, you know, yeah, I think I'd keep the momentum going. I'd release Dread this year, and I think I would release a Prime Trilogy or, or a Prime HD or something like that in the meantime to fill the gap to, until 4. But I, 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 again, I don't know if that would, you know, that would satisfy people enough to not come back for Prime 4, though. I did the definition of what you're talking about with the Sly Cooper thing. I play, I bought the collection. I played one and two. I started three, and then I never bought Thieves in Time until I got it pre-owned years later. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Sly Cooper. I love you. I didn't mean to hurt you. <laughs> 
Poor Sly. It's a whole web of interesting and different ideas and things like that. And I think we've raised some really good and interesting points. But what do you think? Do you think, do you have your own theories as to why the Metroid series has historically not done as well as some of its compatriots? Let us know with a comment down below. And all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, then why don't you lock onto that subscribe button and unleash a super missile at it. And be sure to check out nintendolife.com for all sorts of lovely Nintendo related content. Thank you again for watching. Bye bye. By the end of the year, Dread will have sold 4.76 million units, but there's still eager buyers waiting to purchase. If I can beat Metroid Zero Mission, so can you. Inspiring words.